Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth and Derek Young here from K-State Online as we are set and ready to go on this Friday, ready for K-State and TCU. The Cats and Frogs playing for the third time in two years after uh, two fantastic games last season, both really good, tightly contested, at least until, you know, uh, some injuries and other issues came up. But the game in Fort Worth was was really fun and awesome and an eye-opener last year. And then obviously everybody will remember uh, just how fun and, and good the game in Arlington was. And that's one of those that people probably won't forget for a long time. And that is easily the, I mean, I know that people that would have been there in 03 would say that that's probably their favorite game and the most exciting and whatever and entertaining because K-State just kicked Oklahoma's butt and it was, you know, built up to be one of the best teams ever. Uh, but in terms of, the back and forth, the you know goal line stand in overtime, the performances in that game by both sides, and then you know K State winning on the game winning kick from Ty Zentner. Uh, I think that one, if you were asking just the general public, that would be the best championship type of game K State's played in, and the three Big Twelve titles they've won. Because I guess essentially the Texas win in 2012 is the pseudo championship for the Cats since they needed to win to get the share with Oklahoma, but. An awesome game last year. It's behind them, though. Both of these teams, very clearly different teams in 2023 than 2022. TCU maybe has learned that lesson a little bit harder than K-State, but not very much because the Wildcats thought they had found their quarterback in both TCU games last year with the way Will Howard played. And here we are entering this weekend with a lot of questions at that position, trying to figure out who's the man and, and how's it going to look quarterback split-wise on Saturday. So before we do anything else, D.Y., let's just start and knock out the quarterback topic one last time before kickoff on Saturday. Give me your thoughts and your insight on it and then uh, who you're going with to start on Saturday for the game. At this point, I don't really have any inside intel to, that would suggest which way that Kansas State will go. I wish I did. I think that they've kept that notion, that that decision pretty well kept – under lock and key at this point. And, and I wonder what, if anything does surface before kickoff in terms of the direction that they choose to go in. What I do have is probably more of a gut instinct based on past precedent. My, you know, just being informed on how they typically operate and really just a gut call. And I would say that it looks somewhat like it did in Lubbock. I don't know that it'll be drastically different than that. By that, I do mean that I think Will Howard starts the game. I would be, at this point, especially since nothing has really leaked out, I would be a little surprised if Will Howard didn't start the game, to be quite honest. And then I think he gets that first drive, first two drives to kind of leave his mark. And assuming it doesn't go touchdown, touchdown, which every Kansas State fan should still hope that it goes touchdown, touchdown, even if it is Will Howard under center. If it doesn't, then I think we get the Avery Johnson experience pretty early, just like we did against Texas Tech. And then from there, it'll be more of a feel, probably hot hand situation. Uh, that'll be up to, you know, probably a combination of Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein. You know, I thinking about this situation, I, I, I don't know that I'd be surprised either way. And I would, you know, I, I thought that I, I wouldn't have strong feelings. But, you know, hearing you say that that you just think that it will be Will Howard, I guess uh, I, I kind of sank for a little bit there. My, my energy and enthusiasm for the weekend went down a little bit more just because, you know, I, I'm not so sure that, that that is the play at this point in time. I think what you said in there, though, like K-State fans should want to, you know, if Will Howard's out there to start, he goes touchdown, touchdown. That's what you want. I, I would agree with that because this team is better if you have the Will Howard that played the seven games last year that he appeared in than freshman Avery Johnson. And there's a role for freshman Avery Johnson no matter what version of Will Howard you're getting. But the Will Howard that played in 2022 and won K-State a Big 12 title 
was a legit quarterback. And if you can have that this year, you'll take that guy over a freshman, no matter the talent. The problem is it's been a while since we've seen that Will Howard. And I just am starting to have doubts that we're going to see it. I mean, it's, it's like riding a bike, honestly. It's, it's like it was so easy just to bank on in 2020 and 2021 that there were going to be deficiencies that Will Howard had. And now that he's back into that flow, it's tough for me to go into a game expecting something to be different. Uh, so I, I I think you're probably right. I think just based on how this thing goes, I mean, Chris Kleiman is loyal to a fault at times, maybe to his quarterback. Obviously, the guys that have played here, Skylar Thompson, we all know that the the love and admiration that Chris Kleiman has for Skylar Thompson. And you think of Adrian Martinez and how that played out. Like they went back to him after Will looked awesome for two weeks last year in that Texas game. And after they lose, you can second guess it and people can question and say, well, especially based on how the rest of the year went, like Will Howard probably should have played that game. I, I still don't know the right answer to that. And then you think of now with Will Howard, Will has been through so much with Chris Kleiman and this staff that, uh, they know and believe that there's still a good quarterback in there, at least they think, and they want that guy to shine through, and they don't want this to be just the worst imaginable, worst imaginable four, fourth year for Will Howard that he could possibly have. But um, I just think at this point in time, I, I don't know that Will Howard is going to recapture enough of what he had last season to warrant him playing over Avery Johnson because – when you don't have receivers that can help you out like he had last year, at least in Malik Knowles and Cade Warner, uh, that's really tough for a guy that you know needs to be a little bit more precise with his passing. So um, I, I, I think ultimately the way this plays out is this is going to be Avery Johnson's team at some point. You know, it's, it's easy to say because I'm not the one in the locker room with these guys and I'm not the one making the decision, but if it was my decision, I would start Avery Johnson on Saturday. And see how that looked. And then, you know, if you, whatever point you find the right time to give Will Howard his, his go in that game. But um, I, I think you're probably right. And I, I think that there's going to be a lot of K-State fans that are disappointed and probably think this is the wrong move at this point in time. Very well could be, but uh, Will Howard maybe deserves at least one more chance to, to write this ship because if not, then it, you know, if you get a similar Will Howard performance to what you got the last couple of weeks out of him, uh, then there's no doubt that Avery Johnson should start against Houston, barring you know things looking like a disaster for a true freshman quarterback this week against TCU. I guess on, on this topic, though, if Will Howard is ultimately going to start this game, why would Chris Kleiman and K-State change the depth chart at all this week and put the or there? Because you could do the exact same thing you did last week. It's not like even if you have Avery on the two line still, TCU and Sonny Dykes, they know that they still have to prepare for Avery Johnson in this game, even if Will Howard is listed as the starter. So what what would be the purpose of putting the or in there if Avery Johnson isn't going to be the starter on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. And that's what I, one of my points earlier in the week was that they had an out to, to kind of avoid that, not necessarily having to do that. And they still chose to do it. What, my only I guess, I don't know if rebuttal is the right word, but response would be that they typically have, and this is the first year, so maybe this is just kind of an operational amendment to how they do things, but they have typically kept that up depth chart updated throughout this season. And, you know, it's not necessarily to trick TC. Like you said, I think they're probably going to prepare for Avery Johnson regardless. Maybe this affirms it a little bit more, but I, I think this is just a reflection of how it was going into the week where, you know, we got two guys we can win with, uh, as Chris Kleiman stated. We'll see how it goes. It's obviously the probably most important and most uh, discussed and thought about topic pertaining to K-State this week. So we'll have to monitor it all throughout Saturday, see how things kind of go down and uh, move on from there. Now, as we look around at some of the other stuff going into this game, we've talked a handful of times about just some of the other circumstances that are going to play into this game and K-State success moving forward. We saw a couple of other elements start to maybe come together for the Wildcats last week. 
Uh, you got a second element in the run game with Treshawn Ward going over 100 yards, so now you have faith in him or Giddens given the night. The defense forced interceptions. So heading into this game, uh, what is something that you think will work for K-State both on offense and defense against the Horn Frogs? Yeah. Typically you want to kind of pick apart maybe the defense and where it's flawed. But for me, I would just stick with what Kansas State has been able to lean on this year. Sometimes it's not about what your opponent is not good at, and sometimes it's just about what you are good at, right? Um, I think this is one of those situations. Like at some point Kansas State's going to have to throw the ball uh, to win the game, and the team's going to force them into that. And when that happens, you know, whether it be Will Howard, whether it be Avery Johnson, look, Will, Will Howard is shown to be capable of winning that way. And I think even though we haven't been able to kind of unwind that curtain, so to speak, and see Avery Johnson's throw game, it's certainly uh, up to par for those that do not know. Um, he wasn't a ballyhooed prospect just because he could run the football. It was also because he could really sling it as well. And, and he's been efficient, at least when they've allowed him to do so. Why they have kind of steered clear from that is that his legs are such an un unbelievable weapon. And <laughs> truth be told, they're, they're going to do what it takes to win the game. And if they thought Avery Johnson needed to throw it to win, I think they would have allowed him to throw it. You can make an argument maybe – there was an opportunity for that against Missouri on a couple of occasions. But last week, I, I don't pull my hair out too much over them allowing him to only throw it nine times. And I think he was out there for 35 plays yeah. just because it, it is what was working. It It is – they're going to do what it takes to win. And, look, when, when Avery Johnson runs for five touchdowns, you can make an argument that you're probably doing your team a disservice – if you take the ball out of his hands and and maybe throw it some more. I'm sure he wants to throw it some more. I'm sure his supporting cast wants him to throw him some more. I'm sure his teammates would like to see him throw it some more. But are, are you really making the best decision for the team when he runs for five touchdowns just to throw it some more because you want to throw it some more? You should yeah. do what it takes to win, and, and that's kind of been the thing. So long-winded long answer here is, you know, Sometimes you got to stick with what works. And you got a back that's ran for over 200 yards this year and almost reached 300 scrimmage yards in one game. You got another that almost ran for 150 last week. And you got a quarterback that's ran for five touchdowns in a game. Yeah, Will Howard, it's piped off, I think, a couple 70 yard runs already this year. They need to clean up this passing game. But boy, this running attack is really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the run game is, is going to be used a handful of times. Uh, more than what you know, I think TCU is accustomed to. They faced a lot of teams this season that have been content with just throwing the ball all over the place, or they've kind of been you know thrown into situations where their opponent had to throw a lot. I think what we're looking at is K State is going to be one of the few teams that is willing to go out there and establish the run and just continue to go back to it. I mean, TCU's defense is middle of the pack in the Big Twelve, and and they don't really favor being better on the the rushing or pass defense side. I think they're sixth in both categories in the league. And I think K-State can do a myriad of things against them. And I also assume that they come into this game ready to give the run game ample time to get going and then use that to open up the passing game. And that's why I think Avery Johnson's key in this equation, you know, over, you know, even, even if he doesn't start, it's you need him to be able to add an extra element to the run game that Will Howard can't even add because Will Howard is a quarterback that can run and Avery Johnson is a quarterback that is like made to run. Even though, you know, Chris Kleiman's talked about his arm. Obviously, people have seen his arm from from highlights in high school. Like he can legitimately throw the ball like a quarterback, but he is a he has a runner skill set that Will Howard doesn't have, where a lot of Will Howard's big runs, it's, hey, if you give Will Howard the hole or you give him the scheme, he can execute for you. It's not like he's, you know, Peyton Manning and he's walking in quicksand back there. But 
he is – it's just different with Avery Johnson. You use that, you can open up the pass game that has been a little weak and has not done much this year because there's going to be have, there's going to have to be a lot of selling out on the run game. I mean, Tech, they tried at times, but it didn't really work for them, and they got burnt, and I think K-State's going to have to use that to their ability. And I, I don't know, I'm just banking on this, this game playing out in a fashion that won't necessarily be similar to Texas Tech, but it's going to be – uh, just based off of all evidence we have that they're going to have to go to Avery Johnson a lot in this game. And the way that I see it playing out then is that he's able to put the ball in the air more than nine times this week, unless TCU just is terrible at, at you know deciding what they need to do and being prepared for what might be thrown at them with the run game. But I, I would certainly venture to guess that you know things are going to open up in the passing game a little bit more because of the legs that Avery Johnson has and what he can do when he gets into the game. So Tech, we'll we'll see. And TCU's only played one top thirty offense this year so far. Yeah, you know you know who that is. Oh, uh, boy. Well, I would it have to be? It's probably either Colorado or Houston would be my guess. That's it. Those are the top two. So you're you're right. Okay. Houston Houston is twenty six. Okay. And Colorado's, I think, 37. So those are the only two remotely solid offenses that TCU has played this year. Okay. Well, that says a lot then about uh, how, how things are going for the Horned Frogs. I mean, I kind of assumed that that was uh, that those were the, the ones. but I, And you look at their schedule. It's similar to a lot of Big 12 teams. It's not necessarily like they've played world beaters all season. Uh, but they've certainly had some teams that aren't going to light it up. And I think K-State, even with some of the struggles and question marks they have right now, uh, the, their offense is in a much better position than a lot of these teams that they've played. Now, moving on defensively for K-State in this game, what can the Wildcats do there? We saw the three turnovers last week. I think that K-State is going to be able to force at least two again. Uh, Chris Kleiman has said all year that, hey, these are going to come in bunches. And I also just assume, I mean, TCU threw the ball 60 times last week, and they won 44 to 11. When you win by 33, you don't need to throw the ball 60 times. They just love throwing the football. And Josh Hoover, even despite having a great game last week, he still turned the ball over twice. And I fully anticipate that you're going to be playing a team that is built better than BYU and you're going to ha have to face a little bit of a stronger defense than even what BYU could provide you. Even with all the struggles that K-State's defense has had, injuries or corners that maybe you're still adjusting to this level, I have I have a lot of faith in what they can do to a freshman quarterback for the second straight week. Yes, freshman quarterback again, his first real taste, taste of a road atmosphere as well as the starting quarterback. I think you see – probably similar to what Barry Morton and Jake Strong saw. I think the Wildcats tried to knock the hell out of them. Yep. And <laughs> they they succeeded last week, so we'll see if they can they can get in there again and, and maybe make some things happen. Uh, conversely, on the other side of the equation here, what is the uh, expectation for what K-State might struggle with offensively and defensively in this game? Because there is no shortage of deficiencies for either side of the ball. Yeah, offensively, I, well, I don't know where, where struggles necessarily, so I'm going to try to attack this maybe from a different angle. But I do think touchdowns and not field goals is probably going to be pretty important in this one. And secondly, just maybe a glimmer of hope when it comes to the pass offense would be nice to see. Um, defensively, I get a little worried about maybe the size of TCU on the outside. But that can be helped because it sounds like Will Lee is a shot uh, to potentially play on Saturday. Well, and I like the way that, that Chris Kleiman talked about it on, on Tuesday in terms of the optimism level being a lot higher that he, he does play on Saturday. Because, I don't know, I, I think it felt like maybe that was something that could linger. But I, he, he opened the door a lot more than I thought he might for uh, Will Lee being able to play. So that, that seems, you know, at least – entertaining and, and good plus i mean uh you you know the same type of deal happened uh last week and and jacob parish played so it was a similar type of deal where he talked about it like eh, yeah i don't know like 
won't see Will Lee, don't know on Jacob Parrish, and then Jacob Parrish played. I, I felt even better about how he spoke of Will Lee's chances than Jacob Parrish's going into last week. So we'll see, and that'll be a big deal. I think offensively, one of the areas that, you know, K-State might struggle in here, and this is, I don't know, this isn't necessarily something that TCU does well, I would say, but if you just kind of go and, and you look at, um, how like this might end up playing out. I think just the passing struggles might continue a little bit for K State. If if you're going with the standard like Will Howard dropping back to throw type of deal, um, TCU is a team that you know that just like everything they're pretty mid. They're pretty in the middle of the pack in a lot of statistics in the Big Twelve. But so they've only four or six picks this year, but they still have some talented players in their secondary that could give K-State some trouble. And uh, I, I just think it's going to be dependent on how K-State operates this. Obviously, I said earlier, if you know if they're, they're running it with Avery Johnson, that might open some things up more. But if you start the game and you come out trying to bomb it, it, it may not go uh, as well as you would like. So I, I'm interested just to kind of see how uh, that goes. But that's the only area that I'm really concerned is that even though I think Josh Hoover might turn the ball over, there's an element here where K-State could turn the ball over uh, because I think that TCU still has individual playmakers on their defense that are better than what Texas Tech had. So whether it's Howard or Johnson, both of those guys could be prone to throwing interceptions for different reasons. Howard, just because his decision-making and, and the way he's seen the field this year hasn't been as good, and Johnson because he's a true freshman, that, that would be something that would worry me a little bit about Saturday's game with TCU, but – not to the level where I think they're going to overmatch K-State and it's something that everybody should go to sleep Friday night worrying about. Yeah, it'll be interesting what kind of game we get from the offensive line. I think they were pretty good against UCF, outstanding for the most part against Texas Tech. Uh, those games got some distance in between. There's some distance in between those two games. So how about stringing together, you know, some really solid performances. Uh, so something to look for from the offensive line. Yeah. We'll see, uh, well, the, the offensive line, they, they played better and they keep kind of improving as the season goes on and uh, they, they could step up and buy some time and then it's just up to the receivers now, which I think we're starting to get some, some slivers of improvement. There's still a lot of things that you can see watching a game or watching it back that stand out as a negative, but there are some elements that are good. One of those was Jace Brown over the weekend in, in, in Lubbock. I mean, what is your expectation for Jace Brown and how much interaction he gets in the offense this weekend? I think, again, probably similar to Texas Tech, unless there's really stuff that's really schemed out for him. I think right now he still is in a, a elementary level of understanding, even though he's probably a lot more forward than maybe some of the other receivers on the roster. He's just kind of an elemental wrinkle for Kansas State because he probably, he has, well, not probably, he does. He has a speed element that ne isn't necessarily there with the other guys, especially when you're still trying to get Keegan Johnson over that hump. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the, the Keegan Johnson thing. It's weird with Keegan Johnson because when he's had the ball in his hands, he's looked good. It's just they haven't been able to get it to him, and that's one of those where you have to make the decision, is, is that because of Will Howard or is that because of Keegan Johnson being a part of this receiving unit that, having a tough time getting open in a major way for the quarterback. So uh, we'll see on, on Saturday. But those are the two guys that I think I probably have the most hope and in, in interesting watch on right now from a receiver standpoint is, uh, you know, the Keegan Johnson and, and Jace Brown, and we'll see how it moves forward from there. And, and then R.J. Garcia that wasn't even on the depth chart this week, which is interesting to say yeah. the least. Which I think that one is – that's probably disappointing to a lot of people just because of – you know, he, he made the catch in the Big 12 title game last year, and there was this energy and enthusiasm for R.J. Garcia taking a step forward. But uh, it's just it, apparently not going to be this year uh, if he's ever going to do it in, at K-State. It's going to have to to wait at least another season. So we'll see how it goes uh, from there. Now, a couple of other things in terms of this game. You know, we, we, we saw TCU twice last year against K-State. And they come into this year. The one difference is they, you know, have a new offensive coordinator. Uh, they lost Garrett Riley. They bring in Kendall Bryles. Um, is, is there anything different that stood out to you about TCU when you've seen them in, in bits and pieces this year from last year's team, outside of the fact that they lost uh, what 
like three or four of their best offensive players to the NFL after last season. Yeah, and that's probably what's hurt them the most. No, there's nothing substantial that you're going to see just based off watching them. I don't think you'd have to be a real X's and O's guy to see the different wrinkles and fingerprints that Kendall Bryles has been able to put on this. He's being forced probably to something a little different when he's going from Chandler Morris to Josh Hoover, whereas with Chandler Morris, they'd run it a little bit with the quarterback, not a little bit, quite a bit. It's probably why he's hurt. Um, and that's always been kind of a signature of the Kendall Bryles offense. I, I They've always wanted to incorporate it because it's a, actually kind of a run-focused attack when – people might assume it's more receiver uh, throwing the ball based. And you'll probably get a little bit of a mix there with Sonny Dykes, who's kind of a throwing throwing game kind of guy. Kendall Bryles kind of a running game kind of guy. That's where really that Bryles offense is. That Bryles offense was at Ole Miss under Lane Kiffin. I think it was via Jeff Levy. Obviously, I think there's some brother-in-law mm-hmm. and some familial yeah. connection there. But you remember, man, they were running Matt Corral, of all people, 40 times a game. So there is a QB run game element usually to that offense that I don't know that exists with Josh Hoover. So they're forced into maybe some different ways of doing things at the moment. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be uh, something to to keep in mind. I mean, last week, BYU was just so bad, it didn't really matter. Uh, But BYU is in the bottom of the league with O-State, K-State, and Houston as the worst pass defenses in the Big 12, and obviously BYU just didn't have it, and they weren't going to be able to show up and compete last week. So you you don't have to do a lot of things other than what you feel like you're best equipped for, which was throwing the ball left and right. But I'd be stunned if they threw it 60 times against Kansas State. If they do, yeah, it's probably a good thing for Kansas State, I would think. that That's what I would think, because I, I think that you're going to have to incorporate the run game more, and it's just going to be kind of fascinating to see uh, – if Josh Hoover can be incorporated in any way into that. I mean, if they, if they throw it 60 times in Manhattan Saturday night, there might be four or five interceptions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that would be the hope. I think if you're uh if you're a K state fan thinking about this game, all right, uh, moving forward and, and previewing this game, if you have to pick MVPs on both sides of the ball on Saturday night for K state to get a win, who are you rolling with? Man, actually, my first instinct was Treshawn Ward because I really like the way he's talking right now. There's definitely a comfort and a confidence that exists right now with within him that I don't know that I noticed even a couple weeks ago. Like something is, you know, a switch has been flipped there. So I really like what I'm noticing and, and I guess gleaning from Treshawn Ward, just the energy that – is surrounding him. I think that's uh, that's someone I want to go with and kind of ride that horse. There's just not necessarily been a constant at running back. And DJ Giddens could pop a couple big ones because he is fully capable, and all of a sudden it's his game too. So I tend to think there will probably be a little bit more balance between the two against TCR. You know, I'm not going one guy. I kind of reference this, and I've been – I think I almost convinced myself of it because it kept popping in my head, and then I explained it to you. The offensive line, having a second good game in a row. I don't know that they've been able to string good performances together. I think that is important because I think if they have a good day, they can't say might be able to throw in a run. That, that, that's how I feel. I, I, yeah. So MVPs, just give me the unit, offensive line. Yeah, I well, I honestly, that's probably the best answer that be, that can be given discussing this because all season that's been a talking point is the struggles that they've had and then oh hey they they they've broken out of it maybe it's going to look a little bit different and then you know you think they they fall back down to earth with some serious errors against Oklahoma yep. State but then last week they picked it up and the talent offensively is there even with the struggles in the passing game i think if you're still giving enough time and opportunity there are things that K-State can do in the passing game um, and then also obviously running. I mean, right now you have three runners of the football for your K-State that if they're getting the blocking that they need, then 
they should have yeah. very few teams that can actually stop them. I mean, yeah, three, three. Like if, if you if you're if your offensive line's doing well, having a good game, you got Avery Johnson, Trayshawn Ward, and DJ Gins are all capable of housing something. And then because your your passing game does need like a little pat on the butt, like a little boost forward, um, you get time and maybe if you give the quarterback time, things are going to free up a little bit for you. And with time, Colin Klein can kind of scheme things up a little bit more too. And then all of a sudden when you got the quarterback or even some of those receivers feeling better about themselves, then they tend to play better too. So um, no, here's another way to look at it. Since they started to play Power 5 games, so throw the Simo and Troy game out, this team has kind of gone, or at least this offense has kind of gone as the offensive line is gone because the two best games, uh, probably not – a coincidence were probably UCF and Texas Tech. Yeah. Yep. No, I think that's I think that's perfect. I mean, that that is and honestly, I think all season that is probably the best answer that has been given during this cuz I think each week we're trying to be like, well, we don't want to make it obvious. We want to, you know, whatever. I think you gave the perfect answer there. I think that you were on the money uh exactly and that's I mean, the offensive line is is probably one of the biggest keys cuz I think going into the season one of the reasons why people thought this offense could be successful, uh, even despite what they would have lost from last year's team, was, okay, this is supposed to be, if not the best, the second best offensive line in the Big 12. And they had not been there that really at any point this season. And I think, and I, I've said it a lot, I think a lot of it came down to you had people that were basically gleaming off the accomplishments of one or two offensive linemen. And so others in the offensive line group we're kind of getting lumped in to that and you would look at it and just kind of go, I, I don't know. And, and so people just assume, because I say this a lot, we're idiots. The, the common person that is not just like ins and outs of football are idiots. Like I can even admit that like offensive line play has to be pretty bad for me to recognize like when the offensive line isn't doing their thing, because none of us know how to evaluate an offensive line properly because most of us have never even thought about playing offensive line. And you're following the ball. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those that if you have one or two guys that are good, you're like, oh, the whole offensive line, it's one of the best. Or if they've been good for five years and then you know there's a, a dip, you don't recognize it until way later. Like you'll go another five years before you say, oh, you know what, this offensive line, uh, it's really falling off. It's like, well, it fell off five years ago. You know, I, I always make the comparison to like the Seahawks defense in, in the NFL – or the Cowboys' offensive line. Yes, if you go back 10 years ago, both of those teams had fantastic a defense for the Seahawks and an offensive line for the Cowboys. People are still saying that about the Cowboys' offensive line, and even though they're they're playing better, like the last couple of years, it's been a real dip. Like they're not very good. They they have not they've struggled a lot. And then for the Seahawks, obviously, like you'll see people still drafting the Seahawks' defense in fantasy leagues. It's like. Seahawks defense is not the Legion of Boom anymore. So I just think that that's something where people, they lack awareness. And I'm not like faulting anybody for that because I can be a victim of it at times. But I think just in sports in general, that's the one of the toughest things for people to pick up on, the trend changing. And hopefully for K-State, that isn't the case, that it was just a bunch of us being swindled by good offensive line play last year and a couple of really talented players Hopefully, we're starting to see the real K-State offensive line emerge this week, and I guess we'll just kind of have to wait and find out. Defensively, turn. Um, harder one. I'll go B.J. Payne just because I think last week could be the jumping off point because he looked like he was loving life after he got that interception. I That's not a bad one. I mean, look, I think last Pretty week. Like good football right now, too, yeah. Last week was an, an awesome game for the safeties. They they played great football last week, and I think that that's one of those things that um, the carries over. That, that it probably carries over because they started they had a the, probably their best game was the game against uh, I would say I, I mean I would throw out there and probably say Oklahoma State. It felt like that was when maybe a a, turn, a corner had been turned, so that was good. And then you go ahead and you see what they do last week. Like, I think that they are in a position right now where they are slowly improving and it, it coincides with Chris Kleiman finding the right 
situation and, and alignment, I guess, and, and Joe Klanderman with the safeties. Cause that was, I mean, is that it was either before or after the UCF game where he made some comment about switching around the, the alignment of those three guys. And so far it's worked and it's been better. And, and we saw the results last week in a major way with the turnovers that were forced. I think for me defensively, um, I've been big on this all year. So people are probably like, Oh, there he goes again, talking about the pass rush. But I think the, one of the keys in this is to make a guy like Josh Hoover, who prior to this season had only thrown one completion. I think one of the keys is getting I didn't know who he was. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I don't, like, he, even, Cause even in like, you don't like pay attention to every big 12 team in recruiting. I, and neither yeah. do I, but you typically know who the quarterbacks that they have signed. I think I, I just I remember yeah. quarterback names at least. Like I do not know who Josh Hoover was even as a recruit. I don't remember. Uh, no, let's see, uh, Josh Hoover. <laughs> he was the forty uh, second overall quarterback in the class of uh, twenty twenty two. So yeah, there you and, go. and even you, you're 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 probably even less of a recruiting nut than I am. Yes, but you would remember quarterbacks for the most part. Oh yeah, I don't yeah. remember Josh Hoover. Yeah, no, I Josh Hoover. I, I this is like. Josh Hoover, you could have easily have told me that Josh Hoover was like one of the quarterbacks that Chris Cl- that Colin, or <laughs> uh, talking like my mom when she's trying to name off me and my brothers, uh, that, that Bill Snyder would have signed at one point, and then he's disappeared in like two years, and only the people that follow the program know who he is. I, I didn't know anything about him, and I think that like that is a it's it's a big deal to get in these guys' faces. I thought it was one of the things that K-State did really well against TCU last year, especially that game in Arlington. Obviously, you are missing some significant pieces to the puzzle from that game in Arlington last year. But if you can get a guy, probably like Khalid Duke, because I think his ceiling is the highest of the guys on the defensive line, getting in there, messing things up. He did it He did it pretty well last week at Texas Tech. He only had the one sack where he ch- chased down Baron Morton on the sideline. Um, and I think Javon Banks kind of threw in a death blow at the end of that too, where he like dove on top and landed on Morton. But you know, you mentioned it with Morton and everything. He kept getting popped last week, and that was to the doing of uh, Khalid Duke a little bit. So I think that that is probably a scenario that uh, I would throw out there. So I think Khalid Duke defensively, and then offensively for me, I mean, I'm just I, I'm I'm going to lean into it with the run game and I I could just get everybody salivating and say Avery Johnson, but I think that, yeah, there you go. D Y for the, the audio only listeners, D Y just made a, an odd gesture with his tongue uh, <laughs> to try and showcase salivation. Uh, I think you could have just drooled there. I don't think I needed the tongue action, uh, but Hey, well, you know, whatever. I, there'll probably be a gif of that now. No yeah, you're probably right. Um, but I, I actually think that, I mean, you mentioned Trayshawn Ward and, and being excited about what he does. I mean, I'll go with DJ Giddens because, <laughs> well, back. yeah, a little it's rotating. Perfect. But also, I, I just think, like, we've seen Ward and Giddens have their individual games, independent of each other. Like, if you get a game where those two guys are both on it and in sync, like... Maybe Giddens you, is the home guy. Yeah, that's true. Giddens is the home guy. So... <laughs> I think I think if you get those two guys going, like you're you're already in a perfect spot, no matter who's at quarterback. And then you throw Avery Johnson in that equation, you're golden. And I just think you use Giddens to kind of run it down their throats and see what happens, and and just hope. I mean, the one thing that I think holds DJ Giddens back at times is it just seems like he's going to have some games where his field vision is not there. Like he just is not seeing it. I think that was the case in Columbia. Uh, that was obviously the case um, in the loss to I think Oklahoma State he struggled at times and then last week they they went away from him and Treshawn Ward was obviously having a great game but there was a lot of uh, Drew said it after to us but there was a lot of east and west from Giddens' game which is not necessarily what you want out of him so um, I think that's probably what I'm looking forward to is uh, DJ Giddens and hoping that 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 shines through because I think if he has a big game you've got so many other pieces that are full of momentum and ready to continue it right now that you're in a you're in a great spot offensively if that happens. So I'll, I'll put this on DJ Giddens. I appreciate that in a week where I guess it hasn't happened yet. We expect Michael Boganowski to pick Oklahoma. You're like Junction City. That's the answer. Here we go. 
Uh, yeah, uh, Michael Boganowski has picked Oklahoma. We are recording this uh, just before five o'clock on on Thursday. It that is official now. So oh, uh, it is okay. Yep, yep. So there you go, everybody. Uh, tough go for for the cats not winning out on that one. Uh, which also means that the video that DY and I prepared like two months ago is not going to ever get used or seen. Um, but let's, you know. let's hope let's hope the grand breaks one does. I don't even yeah. know if it's up to date. It might lack the appropriate context. That's true. Point. Yeah, it, Grant. Even if Grant Bricks commits in like you know two months, we're probably sitting here like, well, we just talked about a bunch of stuff that happened in September, and that's not going to work. So yeah, uh, that little behind the scenes action there for you. So that's what what I think. We'll save our game predictions for later in the show. Moving on though, it's time for the the best part of the week little best bets action. Uh, we discussed this on Monday. I don't think – I went two and one. I think you went one and two maybe. Uh, I got yeah. the Indiana Yeah, you one got the Indiana sure. one. So you went one and two last week. So it wasn't a, it wasn't like a stellar week by any means. The, we went three and three combined. But what, this what, week – What were my losses? Again, do, we, do you have that? Uh, well, so I, I know this one personally. K-State, largest Texas lead. Tech, largest lead, 14 and a half. The That's under – I if I if I had said going into it that that bet wasn't going to hit, would you have said that K State loses that game? Yes. I did. Yeah. I did not think Texas K State was winning by more than thirteen now or fourteen now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's 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 how I would have been. I was that, and that was my logic behind it. Was yeah. I think K State can keep it close regardless, but if K State wins, it's not going to get to that number. So then it's like a, a fifty. A, like a 50 50 ball there where I, I felt really good about that one. So that that I missed. did too. <laughs> That missed. I checked my phone after the game thinking to see some more money in there. I was like, I know I had a lock from this game. And I looked and, oh, nope, sure enough, it was not a lock. So, And then what else did I – did I take the UMass one? I know I did for three, Ma. Uh, you, I, you did not take UMass for us. I'd have to go back and, and look. But I, okay. I think I remember from uh, earlier in the week that it didn't ultimately work out there. But, yeah, you know, it was a – we at least gave it a good go. We had fun no, with for, it. It was my first non-above 500 week this year, I think, for the KS Ocean. I believe that you would be correct in that. So, so uh, uh, Uh-oh, so I'm getting cold probably. So be careful this week. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> stay away from DY unless you, you, you just think that he's going to heat up. Uh, so there you go below. There are the best bets for this week. Uh, I'll let DY lead off and, and rip off his three and, and do some explaining because one thing this man likes to do is after Washington has a big win is to say that they aren't going to score a lot of points again. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and the way Forrest one reminds me because I'm feeding Pittsburgh there coming off their big win over Louisville. Uh, hey, uh, that wasn't one of my three, I don't believe, but nope. it was a good pick. Pittsburgh um, got it done last week. So fade them this week, uh, let down spot. I think Wake Forest is just as good as them, as them anyway, and Wake Forest is the home team. So I, I really like that one. So that's probably going to be the one that doesn't hit. Um, yeah, Washington, let down spot as well. I think they, they could still cover. So if there's going to be a letdown, maybe it's uh, the amount of points that they're going to be able to score. I actually forget who they're playing, but under 42 and a half uh, for, for Washington. And it didn't hit last week. When I went under 35 and a half, so be careful. Uh, Kansas State, to be honest, I had a hard time finding a bet that I liked in the Kansas State <laughs> game. So, again, be careful in, in, in that game. I, I just don't think that there's a lot of good low hanging fruit, but I think the Wildcats can score 17 or more in the first half. So, I would do that. Uh, real quick, I went and looked uh, at what it was last week that got you tripped up. It was uh, Washington State minus eight and a half. Oh, that trip which, is both. The trip yeah, is both. Which, which I really liked, um, and it it burnt uh, me. And, and they, got, uh, they, got, they got their ass kicked. Yeah, I mean that was like <laughs> not even a competitive game, or you can't like you can't even spin that like oh yeah you know they you know that just some unfortunate no that was a legit just disappointment bad performance whatever you want to call it. Uh, that and took I, place. I, yeah, and I wore my Arizona shirt after that, so I've been doing the shirt day. So I got the old cats logo on today. So there we go. Smart, smart. You, 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 you're going all cats this week. Basketball um, media day. So you know, got to, got to go basketball. Yep, you're supporting supporting the league as best you can. Uh, all right, my best bets for the week. 
See them below there. I'm taking Iowa minus three and a half. That I think they probably win the game five nothing. So there you go. They could. I mean, that line is on pace to perhaps be the lowest in recorded history, which is interesting. It fell to 30 and a half just a couple hours ago. Yeah. Uh, so scary. I don't like to take teams the favorite to cover in those instances because it's if, if it's really going to be that low scoring, there you have a hard time covering any amount. I, I kind of was hoping the Iowa money line would come down and within a reasonable distance because I do think Iowa will win. I I am a I am a Minnesota hater, as I think a lot of people here are. Yeah, um, not, not a lot of PJ Fleck <laughs> fans around Kansas. Yeah, but uh, I also hate them because I just don't think that they are good. They're not. Uh, so Iowa, as much as I hate them because they're just that is that the Big Ten really pisses me off. I mean, (laughs) when you consider the way that this league looks and operates sometimes, the fact that this Iowa team is basically your front runner now to play for a Big Ten title is ridiculous. It Like, this is a team that... They might play that team who seems to be also operating, interestingly, the old Michigan Wolverines. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, there you go. That's going to be... Yeah. Um, I just... I think it's kind of ridiculous, and I, I even as much as I hate Iowa, and I think that you should probably be better offensively uh, than they are to be considered a good team. They, for some reason, are actually good, and their defense is elite, and they get to play a lot of bad teams. And I think Minnesota is one of those. And so I get what you're saying, like in these low-scoring games, like that. I mean, when the total is thirty and a half, that's a big number to cover. But I just don't know that Minnesota is going to be able to do anything. And if there's one thing that Iowa State has gotten good at is learning how to overcome such a terrible offense and still finding ways to win. And I think they do it in a game against Minnesota, and they they can do it by that number. I believe the SP Plus has the Iowa defense number one. Obviously, that's Bill Connolly's SP Plus on ESPN. I believe he has their offense 133rd. So – the polar opposites of those two is as big of a gap as one would believe. Okay. Well, that's, you know, then, you know, that's, that's typically uh, how it goes. All right. My next one on here, uh, giving the service academies some love air force minus 10 and a half against Navy this weekend. Uh, I, I thought long and hard about this. I was like, do I, do I believe in any way that this could go negatively? And ultimately what, popped into my head was no I think Air Force can handle Navy this year I I I just this is a bad Navy team they're 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 competitive enough and games but Air Force has kind of ripped through some teams this year they've they've found ways to score and what are you what are you saying what are you thinking here why why is the line the same as when they played Wyoming well well that's 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 very interesting well probably because they didn't cover against Wyoming so they were like well we had the wrong one that time let's do it this week (laughs) double down (laughs) it makes sense I I think Air Force is just that much better than Navy and is going to to be all over the place on them here's for your Iowa pick I got it oh wow solidarity thank you for that uh so I'm I am going with the Falcons minus 10 and a half against Navy and then my last one uh I don't. I this is this is me going out on a limb, and after you gave me a very negative speech to start the show, I feel less good about it. But Avery Johnson first touchdown of the game for K State. Uh, that was uh, that's my pick. I'm sticking with it. It's plus seven hundred, so I am going to take that, and uh, I'm not even going to amend it after you made me feel worse about thinking that he could score on the first drive. I'm just going to stick with it. Hope it happens. And at the very least, I'm not encouraging people to do this. But it's not the craziest thing in the world if you want to just sprinkle like five bucks on that and win an easy 35 or something because it could happen. It really could. I like it. More of the helmet stuff. So I tried to get some positive mojo going this week. Got a new helmet. Uh oh. Chris Kleiman, I got your bison. Oof. Well, they definitely need some positivity this week. I mean, what was that two weeks ago that they lost at home? Oh, I don't, know. I don't follow that to Chris State football. Oh, well. And then I bought the TCU helmet, so I can. You're you're supposed break. to be you're supposed to be supporting Chris Kleiman, and you don't even know what the what the Bison are doing. 
I don't know. I, I was thinking about getting a Northern Iowa helmet too, oh. just to really support him because he wore that helmet. Crap, D.Y., they, they do need you. North Dakota State has lost two of their last three. They lost at so home three weeks ago to South Dakota, and they just lost at North Dakota. When's the last time North Dakota would have beaten North Dakota State? I don't know. Are you going to look it up right now? Yeah, I, I got to know this. Uh, it's it's so, and I and got honestly, the, we we it could have been like three years ago, and we just don't know. I got the black TCU helmet, black mat. I don't know what they're wearing. Um, maybe they'll wear white because they're on the road. Little little hypnotoad action. So uh, I do got the Penn State helmet up on the up on here, but you don't like the Penn State helmet. We we came to that conclusion a few days ago. They have a big game with the Buckeyes this week. So, um, yeah, that'll be interesting. All right. I found it. The last time that North Dakota State had lost to North Dakota was 2003. Okay. So. And friend of the show, friend, uh, old friend Grant Flanders and his Michigan State Spartans. Wow. Wow. Well, they also need a lot of good support and motivation. Yeah, and they're playing the cheaters. And they're playing the cheaters. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, you've really uh you've got it all going this week with uh with the the helmets there and just teams going through it right now for plenty of different reasons. So let's uh let's hope that you you're able to work everything out for uh that's KU, everybody. so they're on a bye week. Okay. Well you know but, uh, but they lost Oklahoma in, State. In in basketball season you can uh bust out like jerseys or something and you know you can also put them in the cheaters category with michigan yeah, so but if you want to, this one is probably not really supported around here right mm. the two lane one yeah i yeah, think I, I think people would be more receptive to that than you would think i well, think next year lost to them last year well if they lose next year then yeah you're gonna have to throw it away but i think people are over last year it worked out well for both teams last season so i think it's all right all right Let's move on real quick. Take a look at the Big 12 scoreboard this week. It is uh, getting close to having a full slate of games in the Big 12. We are getting there. We are approaching that How about mark. next year? A full slate next year will be eight games. <laughs> yes, that will, be, uh, that will be a fun time. We've got six games this weekend. Uh, KU is off this weekend. And then uh, who else is the other team that isn't playing a game this week? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. BYU? No, they're no, playing. No, BYU's playing. This is a UCF, good test for us right now. No, nope, UCF's out there playing. Uh, Iowa State. Iowa State's Iowa bye State. week. And I knew that because I talked to Alec Bussey yesterday at Big Show Media Day. And I tell you what, that's a guy that he is he is taking his bye week at Iowa State, and he is back all the way in on his Illini. He is going to Champaign this weekend. So – the last yeah. time you went to an Illinois game, it did not go well. But th that's true. The last time I went to an Illinois game, it did not go well. <laughs> but they're playing Wisconsin this weekend. So it know. will not go well. No, you don't think Mordecai's out? They were terrible last week. Their defense is an Iowa's defense, though. So uh, Illinois let down spot. Okay. Coming off that big win over Maryland. This is a slap in the face to Brett Bielman. You thought you saved your season. Nope, <laughs> it's over. All right. There it is again, the Big 12. UCF and Oklahoma kick things off on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on ABC. Also going at 11 a.m., a just disgusting game, Baylor and Cincinnati. I'm excited to see how that plays out. I, I love the bad, ugly Big 12 games. Uh, I can't wait for that one. And the last time I said that, Oklahoma State and Iowa State played a good game against each other. And both teams kind of turned their seasons around in that game. So maybe this is the jumping off point. For nope. Baylor and Cincinnati, D.Y. shaking his head. He says, no, it's not. Uh, out of those early two games on the slate this weekend, uh, what do you make of uh, UCF, Oklahoma, and Baylor, Cincinnati? Well, if I have to watch one of those two, I probably am going to watch Baylor, Cincinnati, because I think the Sooners, they'll beat the hell out of UCF. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gus, but I just don't see you see it for the Knights this year. <laughs> well, at least he got that contract extension after – three losses to start big 12 play and everything else. I heard the stat again. I, I brought this up and I've talked about it a lot to, to various people, but the state of Kansas this year ran for almost 700 yards against UCF over the course of two games. And I, the, the big 12 radio guys talked about it this morning and they, they went into specifics. The state of Kansas ran for 670 yards and 11 rushing touchdowns against UCF. 
this year. Uh, that is a bad, bad team. And Oklahoma, they can throw it, but they're also not going to be afraid to run it. And I, I'm with you. I think they just destroy UCF. In case we have any Knights listeners, I will get, pump some positivity. Oh, that's good because I don't want them getting mad at us. It just won't be of the football kinds. Football, you're three oh, and three, geez. oh and three in the Big Twelve. But it was interesting. I, had, I saw a UCF tweet just come across my timeline. Your volleyball team is sixteen and two and oh. seven and zero oh in the Big Twelve. Seven and zero oh in the Big Twelve. Oh. UCF volleyball. Women's soccer nine five and one, five three and one in the Big Twelve. And men's soccer eight and one and two, four one and one in the Sun Belt because men's soccer apparently not a Big Twelve sport. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I don't know how many teams in the Big 12 have men's soccer. Yeah, because it says UCF still does men's soccer in the Sun Belt League, so they didn't even do it AAC. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, how about that? A little Sun Belt soccer action. <laughs> uh, good for the good for the Knights. I'm glad I'm happy for them that they that have some positive that, actually, activity. that volleyball thing that's actually pretty impressive. Big 12 is not bad in volleyball. No, that's true. A Big 12. Best volleyball league in the country. That's what I've been saying. You are also good volleyball, so we just brought in some volleyball schools. Yeah. Yep. This is a volleyball conference now <laughs> because it certainly is not a football conference this season. We know that. <laughs> is it a uh, baseball one? I don't think it's a baseball one. I don't think it's, it's a, a basketball, basketball one either. Basketball yeah. and volleyball. Yep. That's all right. I mean, if, if you had to take a combo of sports for you to be the thing, at, although – I think the SEC is doing pretty good being a football and baseball conference. Yeah, so. I, I like how the Big 12 is like, we like those inside sports. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, you're sandwiching the, <laughs> the sports there. Uh, the middle tier of games this weekend, Oklahoma State at West Virginia. Mm, could be interesting. And then Texas yeah. at Houston. Uh, shout out to the Cougars for getting such a, a highfalutin game for their crowd at home before Texas leaves the Big 12. Even if they lose, which they probably will by a million, I think that's a pretty good and fortunate get for them to have Texas play. You get at least one big gate. I'm sure a lot of people coming through watching. Uh, out of the afternoon games in the Big 12, uh, any takeaways there? Because I, I think Oklahoma State at West Virginia is going to be fascinating because both of those teams have an opportunity there to either basically say it's going to be next to impossible to not get to a bowl game if you win that, and if you lose it, you're right back in the same spot that we thought you were three or four weeks ago where things could tank and fall off a cliff. So that's going to be really fascinating. I think either team that wins can kind of prove to us that maybe they are legit. And then Texas and Houston, maybe Houston can just score enough to keep up with Texas, but it seems unlikely. And I think that this is probably not going to go very well for Houston, but they did, they did get 10 days to prepare for Texas. So on the service, I, I don't think I'm going to give Houston much of a chance here. That game just doesn't pop out to me. But the Oklahoma State-West Virginia game, very interesting, right? If Oklahoma State, you know, hadn't lost to Iowa State, I mean, their season is really in good shape at this yeah. point. So, but I agree. The winner, you're looking at maybe a top four, top five, Big 12 finish. The loser, it, it could be a tumble for the loser. Yeah. It could be a tumble. We are looking at – Speaking of Oklahoma State, they have two winnable games coming up at West Virginia and then home against Cincinnati. Two weeks from now, the same weekend that K-State plays at Texas, which could be a massive game, Bedlam could be for a battle for first place in the Big 12 this year. And that is a home game for the Cowboys. Uh, I think that Oklahoma probably kills them this year, but there's at least some life, and I would be pulling for Oklahoma State in that circumstance. But kind of uh, fascinating to see how things have flipped around. That that would be like a Big Twelve banner weekend <laughs> if Oklahoma State takes care of business before then. Yeah. K State takes care of business before then, and they knock off Texas and Oklahoma. Yes, but. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brett, your mark right now. Uh, shout out to the Oklahoma fans and Texas fans listening to this. Brett, your mark is on the phone with his officials right now that are assigned to those games, and get, he is telling ready. them. He's like, yeah. get ready for November fourth, big yep. one. He's like, you you want a bonus? Here you go. You're gonna work for it on November fourth. This is this is where Big Twelve rests rise up against the tyranny of the SEC. Uh, and then our final wave of games in the Big Twelve this weekend: Texas Tech at BYU, TCU at K State. Both six o'clock kickoffs. Um, teams in in semi similar spots. I mean, TCU is coming in to this game against K State. They've played uh, one extra game than the Wildcats. They're four and three. K State is four and two. 
and Texas Tech and BYU both in similar positions, at least in terms of the Big 12, where they've stumbled a little bit. Uh, we've talked a lot about TCU and K-State and what that means. So for Texas Tech, BYU, do you have a prediction and in, in what maybe comes out of that game? I, mean, I don't really have a prediction. I'll take Tech just because I think they're the better team. What I will say is now that Tech lost to K-State at home and are sitting there under 500 on the year, I think at three and four. Yep. Yeah. Oof. The track to them getting to bull eligibility – is very tricky. Um, they have to win this game to, yep. for that to matter because they still have to play TCU at home, and they still got to go to both Lawrence and Austin. <laughs> yeah, uh, if they lose this weekend, that nope. they don't have a shot. They don't. There's no chance that they get hot enough to <laughs> to get in. I, I just I don't see it. Um, and that that's what's so wild about Texas Tech season is how it's gone down. And, I mean, they've played a bunch of these close games. Every loss this year for Texas Tech is by one possession. They lost by two to Wyoming, eight to Oregon, and then seven to West Virginia. And Well, except for K-State. Yeah, that's right. Uh, So, you know, I guess K-State. Is K-State the best team that Texas Tech played this season? Uh, That's what (laughs) what people are asking. Yeah, better than Oregon. Yeah, well, hey. Both both games were in Lubbock. Did K-State lose last weekend? Nope. Yeah, Oregon did. So there you go. K State better than the Ducks. Uh, that's just you know those are facts. I don't know it, it, what what anybody could say to go against it, but yeah, it's it's going to be tough for Texas Tech if they don't pull this thing off. And then for BYU, if they win, I mean, they, if BYU wins, they've already had a better season than I anticipated this year. Their first season in the Big Twelve, and they do need this probably for their bold chances because they have after this game three road games left. And really the only winnable games that I would give them are West Virginia and Iowa State. The way Oklahoma State's playing right now, I don't think BYU could beat Oklahoma State in Stillwater at the end of the year. Um, Things could obviously change and O-State reverts back to what they were, but it's just one of those things that uh, I think to watch out for. So this is a massive game for either team if they want to go to a bowl game this season. And look, going 6-6 and and making it to a bowl isn't necessarily the biggest deal, but it's more so the tag and the status that you would get if you miss a bowl game for being one of these teams. And that's what it is. Like the season already isn't what you wanted it to be, but you just don't want it to be a horrendous and disastrous season, which it would be if you don't go six and six. And I think a lot of teams that are going to be in the big 12 now and moving forward, probably going to have to combat that reality in some years. Cause you're just going to get an unbalanced schedule and some tough breaks and everything else. Um, so that's something to monitor moving forward time to pick the cats game it is time to pick the cats game i think you're just going to say time to pick the cats uh which you very easily can pick the cats if you want to they are playing better football i know it's only been one week of data but it looked a lot better in lubbock and obviously the result was good they played the texas tech team that yes we just talked about how the record is not good but the team itself feels better and has played better against any team that's been put in front of them this year And so K-State getting a 17-point win was very productive. There's a lot of good going for the Wildcats right now. You feel strong offensively if you've got Avery Johnson in there that can do things with his legs. And then obviously Ward and Giddens have both had monstrous games. TCU, on the other hand, they are in the same position that Texas Tech was in and UCF was in. They are playing a backup quarterback against the Wildcats, and it has not gone good for UCF or Texas Tech. We'll see how it goes for TCU. So, D.Y., give us how it plays out on Saturday and uh, who wins with a final score. UCF played with a backup quarterback. Kansas State won by 13 at home. Texas Tech played with a backup quarterback and a third-string quarterback. This is a math answer. And they lost by 17 to Kansas State. Another backup quarterback, another Kansas State win. Look, I I don't know that it always looks great on offense. I'm still – not totally there yet, but they'll, they're, they're going to have a good enough day. I think the defense cracks um, Josh Hoover around a little bit, plays one of their better football games on the year. I think could could get a safety. Wouldn't surprise me. So bold, bold prediction there. Maybe a safety. I'll take the, <laughs> I'll take the Cats thirty to seventeen. Okay, all right. I like it. Thirty to seventeen with a safety in there. That is that is great to hear. Uh, I think that this is 
And we've talked about this a lot in numerous K-State games this year, um, whether it was before the game in a prediction or after a game talking about how it played out. The game could be closer early on than what people want and people expect, but eventually K-State is playing at a better level than TCU right now, and I think that they figured some things out last week in Lubbock, and I think they can translate it this week. They should be able to win at home against every team they play in the Big 12 this year, and I think that they do that on Saturday night, and we'll see if we get a true answer to the quarterback situation, even if we don't, and it's some back and forth. I think both guys can manage. I mean, we've both said when we were picking game MVPs that we're putting it on the running backs a little bit here with Ward and Giddens um, because, you you know, you said the offensive line's got to step up and you like the way Ward has spoken this week. I think K-State is able to, to pull away again in the second half and win 34-20 to 20 is going to be my pick for the Wildcats. I just, the, you know, there's a reason why a team that has a lot of questions or at least perceived questions like K-State open is what, like a seven and a half point favorite against TCU. Um, the, the people that are very smart, they don't think that this TCU team is going to be in a, a great position. And I think K-State turning the corner defensively, they can make another young, inexperienced quarterback pay a little bit. He's prone to the turnover uh, through the first couple of weeks of what we've seen. So I think K-State gets it done and uh, probably another big game for Avery Johnson and the run game. So that is uh, where I stand, Cats 34-20. We will be back on Sunday to break it all down, win, lose, not draw, because you don't have those in college football. So don't worry about that. But myself, KSU underscore fan, and Drew will break it down on Sunday. And then DY and I back on Monday. Also, plenty of great coverage all throughout the weekend over on K-State Online. So head over to On3 and get signed up if you aren't, because what you're going to need this weekend is great information before, during, and after the game, and also busy, busy recruiting content schedule this week. Drew and I both out at games on Friday night, then also a big and important visitor list this weekend for, you know, a lot of these guys are going to be 2024 kids that K-State is trying to add and build on to this class that doesn't have a ton of commits right now. So important weekend and none better to get signed up for K-State online if you haven't already. But that will do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.